ഹലോ മൈക്രോഫോൺ ഇസ് നോട്ട് വർക്കിംഗ് ഓക്കെ അച്ഛാ അച്ഛാ സോ യാ യു ടു ത്രീ മിനിറ്റ്സ് ദാറ്റ്സ് ഫൈൻ ഓക്കെ സോ ഇഫ് യു ആർ ഐ ജസ്റ്റ് കോൾ യു ദൻ ഓൾസോ ഇഫ് എവറി തിങ് ഇസ് ഓൾ റൈറ്റ് ദാറ്റ്സ് ഗുഡ് ആക്ച്വൽ യാ യാ ഷുവർ ഷുവർ ഓക്കെ ഓൾ റൈറ്റ് ഓൾ റൈറ്റ് യു ആർ ഹാൻഡിലിംഗ് ദ യൂട്യൂബ് പാർട്ട് ആർ ദ ഫേസ്ബുക്ക് പാർട്ട് acha acha okay all right then good so you are here until 6:00 you know ഓക്കെ <laughs> overall situation is improving i guess in uh, karnataka it's stable so stable. of course okay. we have no idea <laughs> right no idea how reliable Hi. these statistics are so. sure 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 hey anand jams here uh, anand jamadagni here hi hi how are you i see you i just admitted you you were waiting in the lobby so i had yeah, to yeah. quit thing you always want me to wait for you hi yeah so there are a lot of echoes i'll only be listening okay so i'll go mute and then we'll listen to you why are there echoes huh why are there echoes if there are many people unmute themselves then this that's why i will go on uh, mute yeah please <laughs> Okay. Fact, except the speaker, it is desirable that everyone is on mute. And Feedback. It's also good to turn off video for most people because bandwidth is their problem. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I see that it's also on uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook it's still not alive it's showing some laser experiment <laughs> I think they are maybe Sorry, I have uh, to tell them then they will switch it on make sure Ah uh, okay yeah. yeah Right so today is coincidentally our foundation day so <laughs> when yeah, we talked about how to kumar to yeah yeah <laughs> i didn't realize when we, yeah i didn't realize before so <laughs> yes yeah, good
So are you teaching this this semester? No. No. Next semester. Okay. Uh, Paulos is here. Very <laughs> good. Oh hi hi. <laughs> you already heard the stop. <laughs> You'll hear it again. <laughs> oh, I think he left. Had some connection issue. I think Kumar should mute all except the speaker and himself. Otherwise, we'll have this feedback. feedback. Yeah, yeah. Begins. That's how I do it actually. Okay, you please unmute yourself then. Yeah, since it is just informal, many people can say hi, hello. <laughs> hi, Anand. Hi. <laughs> how are you? <laughs> so, how is Bangalore? Everything good? <laughs> okay. Now I don't know if you're speaking or whether it's a feedback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, so, Girish, we can't start without him. Yes. We'll just wait a, uh, for a couple of minutes and then we will begin. Yeah, Kumar, that's fine. Yeah. So our team is ready, right? I mean, like Basab and other people. Yeah, yeah everyone is ready. The YouTube everyone part is, is already. OK, yeah. fine. Perfect. Good. <laughs> ah, Subhadit, hi. You are muted. Muted. Oh. <laughs> so this is the default option that you are muted and your videos are off. <laughs> so okay. Yes. So yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Anand. Okay. Yeah. So again, I think I will go on hiding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. We all do. <laughs> we have <a> eventually <laughs> problematic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> Hello, Anand. Hi. 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 How oh, that's okay. Hi. Hi. All right. Hi. Well, nice to see you <laughs> after a long time. Your Facebook profile seems to have changed. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Everything is good at IIC. Uh, I mean, every all the students are now uh, no, attending no. online classes, or uh, you no? Know, the first year students have not come yet. So. Ah, Girish is here. Ah, okay, Girish. Yeah. Now it's becoming slower, so I, I'll probably, you know, uh, put the video off. Yes, yes, sure. Yeah, please. Yeah, Kumar, maybe you can begin or? Yeah, so maybe I think we should, it's already. Yeah, yeah already 24. Yeah, yeah. Begin. Sure. So, good evening. Welcome all. So, before that, may I request you all of you know to please mute yourself unless you want to speak something. Also, you can turn off your camera, please. So, we are very happy to have Professor Anand here today with us. He will be talking about the life and the achievement of scientific achievements of Professor Stephen Weinberg, a legend in the physics. And before we go further, so let us, uh, you know, have a small introduction on, you know, Professor Anantanarayan. So he completed his master's from University of Delaware, 
so in 1988 and then he did in the phd in physics at the same place in 1991 then he has done a couple of postdocs so one he has done in prl from 1992 93 then he went to uh, switzerland and where he is there from 1993 to 1996 so then he joined in 1996 center for high physics uh, in indian institute of sciences Bangalore that time it is called the Center for Theoretical Studies so where he was uh, you know, assistant professor from 1996 to 2002 and from 2002 to 2009 he was associate professor and in 2009 he has, you know, since then he is serving the department as a full professor. So he is also associate member of the ICTP Priesta Italy during the period 1997 to 2002. And one thing to mention, he is also recipient of the fellowship of the Homi Baba Fellowships Council. So to come to his research, he is, you know, expert in the low energy physics, particularly focusing on the precision studies. And then he also has a lot of contributions in the beyond standard model physics, probing the new physics at collider experiments with a special emphasis on the international linear colliders. So he also contributed to the development of some of the technical design reports, which are very, very important for the collider experiments so today uh, we are happy to have him with us so he will be speaking on uh, the life and the scientific achievements of professor stephen weinberg professor anand please thank you very much for such a kind introduction it's overwhelming especially when i have to talk about weinberg to be talked about in such glowing terms it's particularly embarrassing uh, so I would like to thank Kumar and Devasish for inviting me. So Devasish made the mistake of telling me that he had missed my talk on Weinberg that I gave in IISC. Then he said he also missed the talk that I gave on Weinberg in IIT Delhi. So obviously that left me with no option but to offer to give this talk in IIT Gauhati. So thank you Devasish for allowing me to force myself on you. And um, my last visit to IIT Gauhati was in November of 2019. Uh, I had come there for the exam of, of uh, Dipanjali, student of Paulus. And then, uh, because I spent more than one day, I gave a talk on the uh, life of Murray Gelman, who had just passed away. So I think I'm uh, beginning to become an expert on uh, you know lives of some of these great people. It's a sound, sign of the fact that now I'm probably a rather senior person, and therefore I should also talk about these things. Uh, I will not be sharing the screen right now because I would like to follow the principles of Patrick Winston, who said that uh, we all have only one language processor. So if you use very heavy slides and if you're talking, the speaker will either listen to you or will look at the slides. So most of the people will actually look at the slides rather than listening to what you're saying. So until the second half of the talk, when I will talk about specific achievements of Steven Weinberg, I will do the talking uh, so that you know you listen to what I'm saying and probably that will help you appreciate the work of this great man. So the uh, my my talk is entitled "The Life and Scientific Work of Steven Weinberg, who passed away earlier this year, 1933 to 2021." So Steven Weinberg was born in New York City on 3rd of May, 1933, and passed away in Texas, Austin, on July 23rd, 2021. Just one second. I think it's my phone. Just one second. Hello. Now I'm in a meeting now. Please call me after one hour. <clears throat> so Weinberg was an only only child of his parents. His father was uh, Frederick Weinberg who had been a court stenographer and his mother Eva, whose maiden name was Israel, uh, was a homemaker. I think his parents are actually the original immigrants from Eastern Europe who had come to, come to the US a little earlier. So uh, Steve, Steven Weinberg was married to Louise Weinberg and then they had one daughter Elizabeth who's a medical doctor. Now, as I said, the title of my talk is a life and scientific work of Steven Weinberg. Actually, there's not a whole lot that is known about Steven Weinberg's life. He seems to have been a rather private person and uh, not much is known about him. But um, they, I'll tell you the kinds of things that are said about him. He was a very hardworking and serious person who did a, put in a hard day's work and that clearly was his life. 
in a way. So Weinberg won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1979, which he shared with Sheldon Lee Glashow. And it turns out that Glashow and he were in the same school, the Bronx Higher Secondary School, and it was shared with Abdus Salam for the unification of the electromagnetic and weak forces. So as we go along, I'll just say a little bit about his work also, because the audience is expected to be gentle. And in the citation for the Nobel Prize reads, for the contributions to the theory of the unified weak and electromagnetic interactions between elementary particles, including inter alia, the prediction of the weak neutral current. So you see, I already introduced one uh, unified force here, which is called the electromagnetic interaction. So this is essentially the work of James Clark Maxwell, who unified the electric and the magnetic interactions, which we know as electromagnetic interactions. So it turns out that in the work of, um, of Weinberg and Glashow and Salam, even the electromagnetic interactions don't, don't stand on their own, but they are actually unified with the weak interactions. And what are these weak interactions? Well, these weak interactions are responsible, for instance, for, um, the, for beta decay of unstable nuclei and also the beta decay of the neutron, the, the free neutron, which decays into a proton, an electron, and its uh, neutrino. So they unified these forces. So just a few additional words about that, about exactly what was their role in this. So the electromagnetic interactions are infinite ranged, as we know. And then the force carriers a photon whose mass is zero. And then there's a relationship between the two. The fact that it's a massless force carrier is a reason why the force is infinite range. On the other hand, the weak interaction is a subnuclear force, which means that its range is very small, which then implies that the particles responsible for the weak interactions that today we call the W bosons are very heavy. What do I mean by very heavy? We need a scale to describe a anything, right? So the scale here is, I will be using this unit from time to time. Mass of a proton roughly is one GeV divided by C squared. One GeV divided by C squared. And on this scale, the weak, the force carriers of the weak interactions are about 80 times as heavy as the proton. You can just keep that in mind, 80 to 90 times. So their role was the unification of this weak interaction, which is mediated by very heavy force carriers and the electromagnetic interaction, which is very light. So how is it that these are on the same footing when one of the particles is massless while the other particles are very heavy? So they are the ones who figured out how you can have a unified theory where such things can happen, where one of the force carriers is massless and the other force carriers are very massive. And this, we know is because of the Higgs mechanism. Everybody has heard about the Higgs mechanism in the recent past work of Peter Higgs. Peter had done it in a idealized model and the actual application to the weak and electromagnetic interactions was actually done by Weinberg and by Salam. The mathematical structure that was needed for this unification was discovered by Glashow. The mathematical objective describes how all these forces sit together. And then there is an additional prediction due to Weinberg and Salam, which is that there is another force which they predicted should exist, which was later discovered in experiments in the mid 1970s. The so-called neutral currents were discovered and the Nobel Prize was awarded to Glashow, Salam and Weinberg only after the neutral currents were discovered. Uh, Kumar, is everything okay? Am I audible? Everything yes. all right? Okay, so yes, do tell okay. me, do, do interrupt me if there is any problem. Okay? Sure, sure. Otherwise, I have no way of knowing, you know, it's like like talking yes. to a okay. piece yes. of glass. So do tell me if it's not okay. So Weinberg held the Josie Regental Chair in Science at the University of Texas at Austin, where he was a member of the Physics and Astronomy Departments. So he moved there after the Nobel Prize. I guess where he was working, it was too cold uh, in the Boston area, and probably he was attracted by the salary and warm climate of Texas, and he stayed there after he moved for the, for the last 40 years of his life. Weinberg taught at Columbia University in New York, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He, in fact, got the chair that was 
occupied by Julian Schwinger for many years, who, they, who had himself moved to the University of California at Los Angeles, probably again in the search of warmer climates. And then the legend is that uh, Schwinger left behind a pair of shoes in the office, which Weinberg had to both figuratively and literally fill. And eventually he moved to the University of Texas at Austin. So having uh, been born in New York, uh, he was also educated in the city of New York. He studied at the Bronx High School of Science, which was sort of a Nobel Prize factory. There were many others from that school, like Jack, uh, like um, like Leon Lederman, I think, was from there. Martin Pearl. These are all experimentalists, each of who won the Nobel Prize. Then he got his bachelor's degree from Cornell University in 1954. And I ask you to keep an eye on some of these dates also. So he was 21 when he got his undergraduate degree. And he got his PhD in 1957 from Princeton University. So he was just 24 when he got his, novel, uh, his uh, PhD. And please note that between his undergrad and his PhD, he spent a year away. In Europe, he was at Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen between the two. So that means that he did his PhD work in just two years. And uh, he was a student of Sam Treeman, uh, where he got the... Uh, PhD degree, but I don't think anything very much is known about what he actually did in his PhD. But evidently, everybody was so impressed with his brilliance that he had a job at Columbia University soon afterwards, faculty position. I guess in those days, one didn't have to do endless postdocs like we are having to today in our field. There's a lot of information on Wikipedia and other sources, not a lot, basically the same information in various uh, combinations, bits and pieces. And there's a bit about his own account on the occasion of the Nobel Prize, which is, of course, now 42 years ago. So he, uh, about 10 or so PhD students were guided by uh, Weinberg, which is not such a huge number considering his uh, reputation, uh, probably because he kind of enjoyed working on his own and didn't particularly have any great interest in producing PhD students. And his notable PhD students are Claude Bernard, a well-known person in lattice gauge theories, Orlando Alvarez, who works on quantum gravity, John Preskill, well-known in uh, today for his work on quantum computing, uh, Bob Holdom, Cliff Burgess, and Fernando Quevedo. These are the PhD students. Uh, Urjit Yagnik, who is a professor at IIT Bombay, uh, he had done his PhD at uh, Texas with the E.C. George Sudarshan, but he had been a postdoc in the group of uh, Weinberg. So um, one thing one must say about Weinberg is that he's, of course, a very great scientist, and he's also a fearless advocate of rationalism, and he's also an anti-religious crusader. He, his belief is that everything is understandable by the human mind, and uh, he has really no time for religion at all. And he has engaged with many philosophers and other kinds of uh, persons and had very long and uh, detailed debates about the nature of the universe and so on. Uh, so he's undoubtedly the most influential physicist of his generation. And I would say that he was the heir to the influence exercised by Schwinger, who we had mentioned a little earlier, and Feynman, and Murray Gelman. Gelman was probably the figure between Schwinger and Feynman and Weinberg. So Weinberg is known for his very direct way of speaking and writing, and his work is so monumental that it would be impossible to describe in a few words. Besides his enormous contributions to research, he is also famous for having written a large number of textbooks and uh, several um, popular books also where he tries to explain what goes on in the esoteric world of elementary particle physics and gravity and cosmology to the lay public. So his main fields of research, as you saw from the Nobel Prize citation, is elementary particle physics, but he was also very fascinated by cosmology. Now, if you recall, the cosmic microwave background radiation was, uh, was first uh, discovered in 1964 by Penzias and Wilson working at the Bell Labs, and it had been predicted in the 40s by George Gamow and some of his co-workers. And I only just now, when I was just looking at Wikipedia, Apparently, in 1941, some absorption spectra also showed that there were some lines associated with the 2.3 degrees, 
but the people who who observed it they had no idea where it was coming from because even uh, gamma and others were not known this is predated them so they thought that probably it was some radiation in, in some intergalactic medium whereas after penzias and wilson saw uh, the radiation they more or less knew that it could not be coming from the galaxy it had to be coming from beyond and this is also confirmed later by uh, by Peebles and Wilkinson and uh, and Dickey who were the other people who were looking for the cosmic microwave radiation. So Weinberg was very interested and impressed by all these things and he wrote one of the great books on gravity and cosmology which was not really his field but he learned the field inside out and he wrote the book on these things. So the Big Bang hypothesis was something that was very important to Weinberg and he wrote this great uh, popular book known as the first 3 minutes which is considered one of the great examples of explaining science to the lay public so he is already known for that so to repeat many of the things that i have been saying one of the architects of the standard model what we call the standard model which is the electroweak interactions and the strong interactions and he figured out how to put the higgs mechanism to give masses to the force carriers in what is called the SU2 cross U1 model and he introduced mixing among bosons that is in this SU2 cross U1 there are all these force carriers and he mixed them and it's called the Weinberg angle which mixes them and one of them gives you the photon and the other gives you the Z boson which leads to the new uh, uh, to the to the neutral currents he has a large number of theorems which go under technical names like soft pion theorems he was involved in phenomenological lagrangians he has theorems on green's functions of in field theory all kinds of things he was also interested in unification having done the electroweak unification he was asking whether the strong interaction could also be united with this and have a full picture of unification and along with quinn and uh, uh and pitchy i think he saw not not pitchy uh, george i he showed the unification of coupling constants in unified theories and he was also interested in one other exotic theory that today we call supersymmetry which of course is not manifest in nature if it is there it's broken so weinberg is very much interested in supersymmetry and knowing and showing how supersymmetry if present will manifest itself in the phenomenological world so one of the approaches of weinberg was always to look at any extension any interesting theory and then ask how do you test it in the laboratory what are the signals of this not quite in the laboratory it could also be in the cosmos because he was so much interested in cosmology he would always be looking for signatures of any idea you may have of elementary particle interactions or models of elementary particle interactions he would ask then what is how does it show up in the cosmos let us say in the early universe what would be the implications of having such a model of elementary particle physics in the early universe would it for instance affect the rate of the expansion of the universe or would it uh, affect uh, or would it lead to the formation of exotic objects in the early universe and if they are there how would they be seen today in the laboratory in telescopes and so on actually one rarely reads original papers of weinberg for the simple reason that most of the work that he has done is already present in textbooks textbook written already in the 70s and 80s they have all distilled the essence of the work that he has done and therefore they have gotten rid of the need for us to read any of his original papers although original papers are extremely clear so i think it is my uh, surmise not that i can prove it that often one just simply copies from his papers and puts it in textbooks <clears throat> so as far as his life was concerned uh, he was uh, what you might call a, a regular american patriot when called upon by his government he would participate in uh, you know thinking about strategy for his government for instance in the uh, during the vietnam war he was a member of jason which is a think tank that was consulted by the us government in strategic thinking and so on and because of his work with the military and military related issues he has also written a few very influential papers in plasma physics of course some of the work done by jason and other military is classified research so we don't know exactly what they were doing but weinberg 
has published a couple of papers in plasma physics based on the work that he has done. One of the striking things of the about the papers of Weinberg is that a large fraction of them are single author papers. Not only are they single author papers, it had they have hardly any references. So this means two things: that he was an extremely uh, independent thinker, and he would work everything out for himself, essentially from scratch. Of course, that's not a luxury that the present generations have. But this was probably the last generation which was able to do things like that. And as far as I can see, he's not a man who used computers very much; just did everything with paper and pencil. So I myself have heard him speak on two occasions. Uh, once in Paris in 1998 at the Niels Bohr Symposium. It was a symposium on the occasion of the centenary of the birth of Niels Bohr. So Weinberg was known to be a very reluctant traveler, and if he did travel, normally the host would have to pay him business class, first class. But I guess because he had spent a year at the Niels Bohr Institute, made an exception and he showed up there, gave a very beautiful talk, a very simple language about the state of the subject at the time. Where he declared that, but he made a comment saying that particle physics is the only subject at the frontier. Now, naturally, this didn't make people very happy, especially in Paris, which is a city where there are large numbers of condensed matter people and all kinds of other branches, and other eminent guests who were also at the Niels Bohr Symposium. Uh, they objected, and I remember Walter Kohn, himself a Nobel laureate in chemistry, he got up and said, "Look, there are many other fields which are just as interesting." And Weinberg said, "Well, why don't you just give us a donation, something like that?" By which he meant that, "Look, we really are at the frontier." And someone else got up and said, uh, "I object to your talk, and I have one more question." And then Weinberg said, "Well, I'm not taking any more questions." So that was the first time I heard him. Then I heard him again in 2009 at the Chiral Dynamics Conference in Bern. Uh, he started out by saying, "It's very good that you invited me today." And not yesterday, because yesterday was the Wimbledon finals, and none of you would have been here since Federer was playing. It was a totally sellout crowd, and even in Switzerland, which has more than its fair share of Nobel laureates, he was quite the star. So, a couple of other anecdotes about Weinberg that I know, basically from Urjit, uh, was uh, one of the students went up to him and said, uh, "Professor Weinberg, why didn't you give me a good problem to work on?" And Weinberg would say, "Well, if I had a good problem, I'd do it myself." And uh, some other student went and told Weinberg, uh, Professor Weinberg, would you like to see my new violin? He said, Well, I know beans about fiddles. So that's the kind of conversation he would have. But even though uh, he was kind of aloof, they tell me that he wasn't unfriendly, and he would talk to everybody the same way, whether it was a student or some very famous person. So Weinberg was called upon to defend the superconducting supercollider by the U.S. Congress. This is roughly the year 1988 or 89, something like this, and he did not succeed. And he said, "I told the senator, 'Don't you think it's important that we push the boundaries of science, and that it is important to know the secrets of the universe and push the boundaries of knowledge?'" Weinberg said, "I remember his entire answer. It was no." So I just want to share with you a couple of other things that I collected. From his sayings, uh, where he has an article that he wrote in Nature in 2003, where he has four lessons for students, which I condensed for you. So he says that physics literature is an unexplored ocean. No one knows everything, and you don't have to know everything to start doing research. Then he says, while swimming and not sinking. So basically, he's saying that look, don't keep on reading hundreds and thousands of books, then you will never start doing research. Just do it. He said, while swimming and not sinking, you should aim for rough water. So what he's telling the students is, don't work on settled problems. You know, just some kind of uh, incremental extension of known results, but you should take up challenging problems. And then he says, forgive yourself for wasting time. Not everything one works on can give results, but one must think. So this is the point that he makes. And the final point, I think the first three are more or less known. The fourth point that he makes, which is not very obvious, is uh, learn something about the history of science, or at the minimum, the history of your own branch of science. So he says that look, only by learning how your predecessors did it, 
you'll figure out what your own mistakes are. And you'll also learn that others have also made mistakes, that it's not wrong to make mistakes. There are many personal reminiscences published in Physics Today, people like Helen Quinn and Preskill and some of the other more recent students have written, but I have not included those excerpts, okay? Uh, so let me say a few words from various obituaries. I have picked uh, three obituaries, uh, one from the CERN Courier. So in his research, Weinberg always focused on an overwhelming vision of physics and not on a model description of any single phenomenon. At a lunch among theorists, when a colleague referred to him as a model builder, he jokingly retorted, I'm not a model builder. In my life, I have built only one model. Now, this is amazing, right? You can say that. It's so much hubris because his model worked. So indeed, Weinberg's greatest legacy is his visionary approach to vast areas of physics, in which he starts from complex theoretical concepts, reinterprets them in original ways, and applies them to the description of the physical world. A good example is his construction of effective field theories, which are today the basic tool to understand the standard model of particle physics. So now let me move to the obituary from the University of Texas. His employer, now please remember that he never retired. Apparently he taught a course even in the spring of this year. So he was still an employee at the age of 88 because they don't have an age of retirement in the US. You can take retirement if you like, but nobody can force you to take. So Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg, a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Texas at Austin has died. He was 88. He was one of the most celebrated scientists of his generation. Weinberg was best known for helping to develop a critical part of the standard model of particle physics. It significantly advanced humanity's understanding of how everything in the universe, its various particles, and the forces that govern them relate. And here is an obituary from his hometown, uh, New York Times. So it's again more or less repeating the same thing, but I want to read out this excerpt for you. Though he had the respect almost all of his colleagues for his scientific abilities and insights, he also possessed a rare ability among scientists to communicate and explain abstruse scientific ideas to the public. He was a sought after speaker and he wrote popular books about science, namely the first three minutes, a modern view of the origin of the universe. Then one of his colleagues, Willy Fischler, says he had a knack to consider the important problems, but not only what was important, but what was solvable. Now, I want to make a point over here, and this will show up in the slides that I will share with you, is uh, when you go through the course of his scientific life, you will see that he seems to be involved in every single important paradigm in elementary particle physics and even cosmology to some extent, or quite say inflation, but he followed all these subjects and all these developments. But I would rather say that he didn't just follow the paradigms. He probably was the guy who created the paradigms. You know, there's a distinction between the two of you working on the leading paradigm of the time and you being the person who creates the paradigm. So I think he was actually the latter. Uh, Although he was not particularly known for humility or anything like that, I don't think he oversold himself either. So he was not a flamboyant, outgoing personality. He was more the serious scholar. Um, these are all things to be kept in mind. So I've organized my talk in this way so that students also begin to appreciate how a great scientist works things and goes through his or her career, influencing the life of the subject, not just their own life. Okay, now I... Now I will share my screen with your permission. Uh, okay, Please. screen, share, share. Is that good? Can you see my screen? Yeah, yes. You can. Okay, good. Okay, so what I have done over here is to organize for you, essentially in the order of his most cited papers. Now, this is very interesting because his most influential work actually seems to follow this pattern. One doesn't like to think that Citation Olympics actually means something, you know, except when you're applying for your tenure or applying for a postdoc, that citations and all these things really shouldn't matter much. But here I see there is a very strong correlation between the citation history of some of his papers and exactly how he has influenced the subject. 
So my, the first paper that I want to demonstrate to you and show you here is this paper called A Model of Leptons. Now, this is not just his, own, his most cited paper. It has another distinction. And I don't know if any one of you knows what the other distinction of this paper is. Is there anybody who knows the other distinction of this, of this particular paper? OK, I'll tell you. It's the most highly cited paper in elementary particle physics. It's not just his most highly cited paper. OK, this is called a model of leptons. And he also tells a story about how he wrote this paper. So he said that he was one day driving his red sports car and it suddenly occurred to him that the model that he had in mind and he was working on, he was applying it to the wrong phenomenon. And then he suddenly realized that the model, which he had got right, needed to be applied to the electroweak sector and not to the strong interactions where he was thinking about it. So then he said, oh, I immediately wrote up this paper and then of course it was published. But the first few years of its life, hardly anybody noticed it. And only after a few years, it started picking up uh, citations and became the most cited paper in history. So this also means that we shouldn't get terribly discouraged if our papers are not cited. So it's also important that we also have a red sports car and drive it and think about physics, I suppose. So this is published in Physical Review Letters. And as you will see, when we go down this list, large number of his papers are published in physical review letters and a large fraction are single authors. And most of them have very small number of references. That's how one should do science. But today's world, that's not possible. You see, this paper was written already about 50 years ago. Recently, the CERN Courier even celebrated the golden jubilee of this particular paper. So it was in this paper that he proposes this SU2 cross U1 model and shows that it is a viable model for electroweak unification. Not only that, he introduces the Z boson and he introduces the W boson. Now, I might have told you two years ago in IIT Guwahati that Gelman was also toying with similar models where he called these particles X and Y. He didn't quite know what they were, but he was calling them X and Y. And almost as if to spite him, Weinberg has called them W and Z. No, please don't quote me. All this is off the record. Okay, But I think that maybe that's the reason why he called it a W and Z, so that they don't get confused for Gelman's X and Y bosons. So he shows exactly how they mix. Not only that, in this paper, he shows that there's a relationship between the masses of the W and the Z and it's related to the same mixing angle that he has introduced for the mixing among these things to get the photon and the Z boson from the bosons of the SU2 and U1. So you see, it is not just some mathematical trick that he is doing. As with most of his work, everything that he does for him must have a physical application. So this is where the Lagrangian is proposed. But of course, as you know, in quantum field theory, just having a Lagrangian is not enough. You need to have many more properties associated with the Lagrangian. You have to show that you can use it to calculate various processes to higher and higher orders in the coupling constants. See that the model is what is we, what we call renormalizable to prove that this model actually has renormalizability because the Higgs mechanism is introduced over here to give the masses to the W and the Z. So this paper, I guess, which is 1967, nothing is known about the properties of models, especially those which have the Higgs mechanism. We had to wait till 1971 when Toft and Weltmann showed that models with spontaneous symmetry breaking, also known as the Higgs mechanism, are renormalizable. So I think Weinberg would have very much liked to prove it himself, but he didn't quite get there, although he was thinking about it. Right? Whereas Toft and Weltmann, they were using the path integral formulation of field theory. They were able to do it. And also, uh, Weltmann had developed a massive computer program to be able to do all these things on the computer with symbolic manipulation. It was a kind of a precursor to, he, he used a language called Schoonship which is a precursor to Maxima and uh, which later became Mathematica, of course, which all of us use today. So Weinberg didn't have an access to all those things. So he was trying to use arguments to show, but it didn't quite happen. So anyway, here they predict the existence of this Z boson and neutral currents, which were as yet unknown. 
And a few years later, I think 1973 or so, maybe 75, uh, there's a collaboration called the Gargamele collaboration. Why is it called Gargamele? Gargamele is the mother of Gargantua, one of the mythical monsters, enormous. So this bubble chamber was an enormous bubble chamber experiment at CERN, which confirmed the existence of neutral currents. So Salam also writes about it, about in his Nobel lecture, about how they went to Geneva and to hear about the discovery of the neutral currents. And Salam writes somewhere that he was struggling with a suitcase and uh, one of the experimentalists drew up next to him and said, why didn't you get in? We have found a neutral current. And Salam said, I was more relieved that I didn't have to carry my suitcase any longer and to actually know about the neutral currents. They're all exciting romantic stories of that day. And this model predicted the existence of these physical particles, W and Z, which were found later after the Nobel Prize of these people by these collaborations, which are called the UA1 and the UA2 collaborations, for which later Carlo Rubia and Simon van der Meer were awarded the Nobel Prize. So this is this amazing paper. So the second paper, which was a bit of a surprise to me, was more of a review type paper that Weinberg wrote, which is called Phenomenological Lagrangians. And this has to do with the interactions of particles at low energies of pions, as you all know, pions are force carriers of the internucleon force. They are actually very peculiar particles which have very special properties. They are called Nambu Goldstone bosons. See, one of the ideas that runs through the work of Weinberg is that of symmetries. Symmetries, 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 field theory, field theory. But these symmetries in field theory are not always realized the way we want them to be realized. But there is a different realization which is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. So it so happens that in field theory, these things happen. Uh, one of the known examples of spontaneous symmetry breaking is the existence of superconductivity, for instance, which is not in relativistic field theory, but in the laboratory. And the fact that you can have superconducting modes, which in particle physics are called Goldstone bosons. So this was also predicted. And then the third most cited paper of uh, Weinberg, was the proof that in relativistic theories, such things make sense. And this is a paper written with Goldstone, who was one of the originators of the idea. And again, Salam, you see, you can see that the work of these people is going hand in hand. They were both kind of friends and rivals at the same time, doing very similar things, thinking about the same problems and finding similar solutions. So this is one of the things that I wanted to point out. The interesting aspects of uh, Weinberg's work, the overarching influence that he had in every single paradigm in field theory and the phenomenology of electroweak theories. Symmetries are one of the most important paradigms that runs through elementary particle physics. You can see that Weinberg has extremely fundamental contributions to these. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that this paper was about 1960 or so when Weinberg was still a relatively young man. He was only about 26 or 27 when he was doing all this work. And he was doing many things at the same time. You will find a large number of highly cited papers almost roughly at the same time. You know? So he's simultaneously working with Salam. He's also doing work on his own. He doesn't like to collaborate very much, but I think something as important as these broken symmetries on which everybody is working together uh, is the only way to accelerate the subject. Now, I mentioned various particles already, for instance, neutrons and protons, electrons and neutrinos. Now, neutrons and protons together, each of them is called a baryon. A neutron may decay into a proton and an electron and an antineutrino. But you see, baryon number is conserved. It's not as if the proton can, the, the neutron can disappear into something that is not a baryon. So baryon number is conserved in the standard model. And when it also produces an electron and an antineutrino, each of which has a lepton and an anti-lepton number, again, the lepton number is conserved. So in the standard model of which Weinberg is one of the authors, baryon number and lepton number are simultaneously conserved. But Weinberg has this idea of unifying the strong interactions also with them, putting all these interactions into one beautiful mathematical unified picture and in such a picture, baryon and lepton numbers don't have any uh, sanctity. 
So you can have a situation where these numbers get kind of mixed up and transformed into one another. In India, we used to have a very important experiment at the Kolar Gold Fields here, not far from Bangalore where I am, which for a long time hunted for such baryon and lepton number one uh, violating processes. So called proton decay experiment of the Tata Institute took place in the Kolar Gold Fields. Of course, to date, we have not found such processes, but we have limits on the existence of such processes. Should such processes exist, then what are the rates at which you could have the violation of baryon and lepton number, either separately or in some combinations? So this is one of the things that Weinberg was very much interested in. And you see here he has this physical review letter. Now, most of us go through life publishing one or two, maybe three physical review letters. But for him, it's not much of a problem. But then, of course, we are not Weinberg. So that's one thing we don't have to worry about. So here he looks at what are the possible signals of baryon lepton number violating processes influenced by his work on grand unification and proton decay. Then I will go through, uh, how am I doing for time? I have another 10 minutes or so, so I can just tell you a little bit more about his more technical work over here. So pions also scatter among themselves, right? Any two particles can scatter among themselves. Now, a scattering length is something which you come across in quantum mechanics courses, basically controls the strength of the scattering at very low energies. So at a time when people didn't have much of an idea of what the scattering length should be, he did a calculation, I think this was in 1967 again or so, where he did a calculation based on symmetries and so on, where he showed that these scattering lengths are actually quite small, much smaller than what one ex expects. So this was at that time, but later it was developed in the 70s and 80s by many authors, and it has been turned into a precision science. So you may ask, what is the point of doing all these things? The point of doing this is that pion scattering lengths probe the nature of the strong interactions and the residual degrees of freedom of the strong interactions. <coughs> So very precise information on scattering involving strongly interacting particles or their residual degrees of freedom probes the nature of the strong interaction. So to that extent, it's fundamental because today you also try to solve, <coughs> excuse me, solve the strong interactions on the computer. That program is called lattice gauge theory. And lattice gauge theory makes very specific predictions for various observables, including scattering lengths. Therefore, it's very important to have effective field theories which will predict these and their actual measurement on what you call the lattice, as well as from experiments. There are classes of experiments from which you can pull out such quantities like pion scattering experiments. I want to turn to the other major piece of unification which has never happened so far. We've talked about the electromagnetic interaction, the electron weak interaction, trying to unite that with the strong interactions to get some grand unified theories. But there's a fourth force in the universe, and that is gravity. And gravity has a peculiar property, which is not shared by any of the other forces, is that it's always attractive. So that is why at very long uh, distances, all the other interactions kind of get switched off because of mutual cancellations. And at, say, the interplanetary scale or the intergalactic scale or, or whatever, the inter, the inter supercluster scale, it's only the gravitational interaction that plays a role because it's the only thing that is attractive all the time. This force, we have not been able to unite either with quantum mechanics or with any of the other forces. There are various scenarios using symmetries and so on where attempts have been made. And clearly for Weinberg, one necessarily needed to have experimental signatures if such a theory were to be the theory of the universe. One such theory is what is, what is called supergravity. It may come out of a future string theory, who knows. And he asks if you have supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is a symmetry that relates bosons to fermions, fermions to bosons, which we have not seen in nature. If it is present, it must be broken. 
and if it is broken where is it what are the signatures of these and how does it get broken so he has this idea along with Lawrence Hall and Joe Lytle I think he was one of his PhD students uh, of how supergravity could be the messenger of supersymmetry breaking so in this paper which is from physical review which also has lots and lots of citations uh, he asks the question of how to build models that make sense so this is one more paradigm in of which he is one of the uh, one of the fathers so to speak of trying to use gravity as a real phenomenological model this is the other paper that i had mentioned where he talks about the hierarchy of interactions if there is a unified theory you have the strong the weak and the uh, and the electromagnetic interactions sitting together each one of them has its coupling constants and in quantum field theory what happens is what you call a coupling constant it is not a constant but it is something that is a running coupling constant which changes with the momentum at which a particular measurement is being made and what controls the running of this coupling constant is what is called the renormalization group so this renormalization group is also an object and a notion and an idea that really held the attention of Weinberg in many of his papers he's interested in the program of renormalization and the renormalization group he is very thrilled to find that the couplings of these three interactions seem to come together at a unification scale of about 10 to the 15 GeV now the electroweak interactions are taking place at 10 to the power of 2 GeV there's a Planck scale where quantum corrections to gravity begin to set in that's 10 to the power of 19 GeV. And then there's another scale somewhere in between the two, four orders of magnitude below the Planck scale, where these coupling constants are coming together. So he's very thrilled with this. Not only that, it makes a prediction for the Weinberg angle, which is a number which, again, when you run it back to the low energy scale, begins to agree with the experiment. So Helen Quinn says in her personal reminiscences, that when he heard about all these calculations that they were doing together and it worked out, he took all his co-workers home and poured out a glass, glass of sherry. So that's very important. All of you, please keep your glasses of sherry ready to share with your students and your postdocs and your colleagues, of course. Yeah. So that is one of the important things that he has done. But I also want to draw your attention to one of these papers, which is just a relationship between the masses of certain particles. So for Weinberg, nothing is beneath his dignity. It's a mass of a particle or unification or some great idea. For him, all these problems are interesting. And to date, his work comes in very handy for people who are doing all kinds of higher order corrections with its implications to, let us say, the G minus two of the muon. Here is another paper. Now I'm more or less coming towards the end of my talk, uh, talking about some of his important contributions. Quantum chromodynamics is, is the theory of the strong interactions. In very energetic collisions, you have quarks and gluons and so on produced, and then they are produced in what are called jets of particles. So here he is writing a paper with the great expert on quantum chromodynamics, George Sturman. Together they write this physical review letters, which is again a citation classic on how jets are formed in quantum chromodynamics. Then he also unites photons and gravitons and the behavior of scattering of gravitons, which are always a bit mysterious because gravitons are associated with Einstein's general theory of relativity. They are spin two particles. One is not accustomed to their interactions. But he uses some simple ideas to show, to prove some theorems about the scattering of photons and gravitons. Here is another paper that I told you about. He's interested in the renormalization group which were developed much earlier by Gelman and Lowe and Kalin and Simanzik. And he wants to do things his way. And this is what the abstract sounds like. Unlike the Gelman, Lowe and Kalin Simanzik equations, they can be solved for arbitrary momenta. You see how the simplicity of his language, the solutions involve the momentum dependent effective mass, as well as a momentum dependent effective coupling constant. Then he has these other papers which are kind of uh, technical and I don't have to say much about them here. I can share this file with whoever wants this, but I want to spend a little bit of time on three or four more of his papers. 
So in this paper, he is asking himself what happens to symmetries in the early universe. All these symmetries that we said are all broken. You know, all this you do, Suban is broken, unified theory is broken. But supposing you go back in time where the universe is in a hot soup and a big bang, can you have a restoration of the symmetry? That's the idea that he deals with over here. It's not just an idea. He does the calculations of taking these field theories at high temperature and working on them. And to show how the symmetry can be restored. And he also looks at the cosmological implications of this work. Now, what happens is as the universe is expanding, supposing you have a symmetry and the symmetry breaks. And in different parts of the universe, which are not in causal contact, it may break somewhat differently. So there are regions in the universe which are not in causal contact where the symmetry is broken and they could not have communicated to each other. So that means that something must have formed in the boundaries of these. And these are what are called defects, cosmological defects. They could be domain walls which have formed. And there are analogs of this in material science and in, uh, you know, in terrestrial systems also where when phase transitions take place, you can have topological defects. So that's the idea that he talks about over here. Here is a problem, a paper that he has written called the cosmological constant problem, where he talks about, needless to say, the cosmological constant, which enters the Einstein equations. And just, just look at the citations. There's more than 5,000 citations. And he talks about five different approaches that he has discussed in this paper. See the clarity of his thinking. He can just compartmentalize and look at these things. Here's another paper that many people probably don't know about. The precursor to modern string theory was a model in the 1960s, which was called a Veneziano model. It was a theory of scattering of so-called uh, QCD strings, what today we call QCD strings. It is a picture in which you have quark anti-quark pairs, which are bound together by a flux tube, and then they scatter off each other. And that's how it gives rise to string theory. That was the first paper by Veneziano. The second paper on the subject was written by Weinberg with Adamolo and Veneziano in this particular paper. So you see, he's always on the ball. No matter where he is, he knows the most important development in the subject. Okay? And he's also willing to go and talk to the experts and learn from them. Of course, most of the time, he would listen to these talks and then go and do things on his own. But here was an example. He's actually written a paper with Veneziano on the Veneziano model. You know? So this is something that I wanted to point out. So as uh, Weinberg became old, which we all will or have already become old, as in the case of your speaker, you also want to hand over your mantle to someone else. So one would say that the heir apparent to Weinberg is probably Edward Witten as the most in, in important theoretical physicist of his era. And here is a paper that he has written with um, with uh, written over here, limits on massless particles. So this is also a very important paper where they look at the properties of spins of a, uh, you know, particles of specific spins and what happens in renormalizable field theories. But he's also interested in string theory. Look at this paper over here, coupling constants and vertex functions and string theories. And I want to finish this talk by just reading out the abstract of this paper, which is so simple. We describe the structure of the vertex functions that may, must be in, inserted into the path integral, or the S matrix, to describe the emission and absorption of general particles in bosonic string theories. The constant factors in these vertex functions and in the path integral itself are calculated in terms of the string tension and a single free coupling constant. Nothing could be simpler than this. You see, in his work, there is no fancy mathematics. Not that I'm against fancy mathematics, but what I'm trying to say is that he's trying to simplify things, the basic, most simple building blocks. So in this sense, Weinberg is a prophet of what we call as uh, the reductionist approach to the physical world, to physical laws. He always believed that you can always get the hang of things by breaking things down to the smallest elements. The other school of philosophy is that from very simple things, a complex phenomena are born and you get, you know, structures that you can't quite describe from this reductionist point of view. 
these are two competing tensions in, in, in any subject. And he also participated in these discussions. Uh, for instance, he does say that a phenomenon like spontaneous symmetry breaking cannot really be understood from the point of view of this kind of reductionist approach. So in this one hour, I hope that I have conveyed to you both some aspects of the life and the way in which Weinberg went about his business and his work and his life, not so much his life because we don't know a whole, whole lot about it. His work is definitely a touchstone to people who work in this field to keep in mind how to approach problems. So I think I'll stop here and I'm more than happy to take any questions or discussions if there's a, anybody has any comments. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Professor Anand. Uh, so it's the time for questions uh, and before that i should admit that you know it's a very detailed presentation particularly about the contributions uh, of uh, stephen weinberg in the context of both electroweak and the strong sectors which many of the high energy physics people are working these days yeah questions please yeah girish please uh, so thank you professor anand for an excellent talk uh, and uh, yeah, I wish you could be here personally, and we we really at least I miss your presence here. Uh, well, so uh, my question is, uh, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So my question is, uh, I have two questions, unrelated questions. The first one is uh, basically, wh why do you feel that uh, this unification of the uh, strong nuclear force with the remaining uh, forces excluding gravity is uh, not so straightforward in the sense that why did why do you feel that it did not happen like in the same vein like logically like what is the basic bottleneck there is there one or it's so it, it, it's only phenomenological you see uh, for instance you at the time of the fermi theory uh, which was in the 1930s one would not have known that by 1979 you would have a unified theory with electromagnetic interaction. So probably we were carried away and we thought that the same program would work and then the beautiful mathematics associated with group theory and so on would be the right picture. Maybe it is still the right picture, it's just that the phenomenological signals predicted by such unification like proton decay or existence of magnetic monopoles they have not been experimentally realized. Maybe they are at a, at a level where another 20 years of experiments have to take place until we really reach higher, uh, uh, higher levels of precision before they, are, um, um, before they reveal themselves. I think in the 70s and 80s, there's a lot of optimism that it's round the corner, but it just didn't happen that way. Just as it is with supersymmetry, we thought that, you know, Susie particles are round the corner that they will be found at the SSC, but SSC didn't happen. Then we said, oh, maybe it'll be found at the LHC, but LHC is much, much lower energy. It's only 13 TeV compared to SSC, which was supposed to be 40 TeV. So who knows? You know? The thing is, these may reveal themselves also in very indirect ways. There is a big puzzle in the B physics sector, for instance. There's a puzzle in the G minus two of the muon. We don't know where this kind of new physics is hiding. So it could be that simple-minded pictures like gauge unification at one loop is not quite the picture. Have I answered your question or not? Yeah, I suppose so. So my second question is uh, more related to sociological aspects. So I recently saw one uh, news clipping by, I think, some retired professor of physics from some university in either Tamil Nadu or somewhere else. So he wrote uh, that, uh, uh, you know, India has finally won Olympic golds. Now it's time for India to win Nobel Prize. I mean, uh, at least in physics, I don't know. I think he's, he's a physicist, so he meant probably physics. So my question is to you, of course, very provocative maybe. Uh, what is uh, preventing Indians from winning Nobel Prize in physics? Uh, Indians have been winning Nobel Prizes when they live uh, in U.S. So we have proved that genetically we are not inferior. So this means that, in my opinion, this means that it has something to do with the level of preparedness. You know, even if we add up and all sigma i over all institutes, 
I running from IIT one, IIT two, IIC, PIFR. You will find in particle physics probably 100 or 150. I'm not counting students, faculty members who know particle physics at the level of doing research. Now that would fill uh, probably one street in Boston, you know, between MIT, Harvard, Northeastern University, Boston University, and Brandeis. They would have outstripped you by a factor of three at that level of competence, maybe even higher, a bit lower, and so on. So, you know, it is a numbers game. How do you compete? And anyway, theory is not the only thing. It's, 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 it's experiment, mainly, which wins Nobel Prizes. One lab in MIT probably has more than three IITs put together in terms of their investment, no? So, since Nobel Prizes are extreme outliers, five sigma, six sigma away from the mean, what are the chances that we are there? So that's that's probably how it works. So yeah, anyway, that, that particular yeah. article uh, does a reasonably uh, detailed analysis also of uh, these uh, statistical issues, and, mm -hmm. and he seems to claim that it's uh, despite all these difficulties, uh, Indian search ought to have won by now, uh, but they still haven't done that. To him is a mystery. So I was wondering what maybe I can send you the link of that article. No, 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 please go. Uh, so he, Nobel Prize. Oh, maybe no. I'm too old okay, for it. I have yeah. ruled myself out of that game long ago. Maybe in peace or literature, but not physics. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if Girish, if you're done, maybe we can take the question from Shubhaditya. Hi, Anand. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. Actually, I just have a question on this historicity. I, I was just curious on this part that when we uh, when he wrote this paper on, I mean, arguably perhaps his most famous paper and the most cited paper, which is about this model of leptons, which basically talks about SU2 cross U1 unification. So uh, actually, uh, uh, it, it was which year and then uh, at Gargamele you mentioned that there was this neutral current and the di discovery of Z boson occurred and that was in which year? I mean, uh, how many years later actually that was discovered? Seven or eight years. Or maybe six. <coughs> 67, I think, <coughs> his model of leptons. Mm -hmm. Salam, of course, uh, he had his uh, Nobel Symposium publication roughly the same year, mm -hmm. a few months. The group itself is there in um, 1961, I think, Glashow. So Glashow has written an obituary also where he says that he has the angle there, but I have not looked at it. Gargamele is about 74, 75, something like this. Right. So, so you see the progress of technology is also important. Mm -hmm. To have experiments of that scale, to have detectors of that scale. So I think in the Nobel... Uh, lectures of each of these people, you will find a discussion of exactly what is the timeline. Mm -hmm. No, but still, I, I, yeah, but that answers my query. I mean, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe so, I can ask the question. Anand, are you there? I mean, yes, I mean yes. can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me, right? Oh, so I, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I just, uh, I mean, I did not hear any talk of Weinberg live. So only talk that I could attend uh, live was last year when he gave a webinar on the development of uh, effective field theory. Yes, yes, yes. So, 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 so I was very surprised that the approach you have taken today to give the talk was exactly same as his. He did not use any slides. I see. So he just, he just spoke on the development for one hour continuously. Yeah. So, so, so since you have attended his live talks, I mean, how was it? I mean, he, did he use Blackboard or he, he was it just... Uh, oh, no, no Blackboard. He just talked. He just talked. Oh, he just talked. Okay. Yeah. So, same approach he has been... Following. See, it was, it was more like an oration. I mean, the 2009 mm -hmm. Parallel Dynamics Conference, it was just, a, just an oration. And uh, mm. the hall was packed, not just with conference people, but with the general public. They even had a CCTV. They didn't have, of course, in those days, any, uh, uh -huh. live streaming on the on, on the web. But mm -hmm. they had CCTVs. Everything was full, which I thought was surprising because uh, 
he is not Richard Feynman in terms of his uh, fame. And the uh, topic in the conference is very technical, but it is still astonishing. It just means that uh, there is a lot of thirst for technical knowledge also among lay people to know what it is that scientists are doing. So mm -hmm. This is my interpretation. I see. Also. Okay, okay. So my, my la next question, I mean the last question is that you did not mention anything about Glasso. So since they were school friends yeah. and Glasso also wrote in his obituary that uh, he wrote one or two papers with Weinberg and he also regretted that their collaboration did not take off as expected. So do you know any anecdotes or anything about that? No, I don't know much about that. Uh, I see. You know, yeah. they were together at Harvard for as colleagues. They were in Harvard. I would say right. about 10, 10 years. There's a, there's, they have two or three papers together, which are, of course, important. Uh, and George I has worked with both of them. He has worked with George I Glass Show model and there's this uh, yeah. and so on. They had a vibrant uh, intellectual environment there, I suppose. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you can never say why two colleagues want to work with each other, don't want to work with yeah. each other. So, right. um, yeah. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Yeah, oh, Professor Anand, there is uh, some question from the sure. student side. Maybe yeah. he has uh, some microphone issue. I can read out the question. Okay. Says, it was a really nice talk. Would you like to comment on the next big thing in physics in the coming years from a theory or a phenomenological perspective? I mean, in the particle physics. Uh, I would say that uh, the discovery of the Higgs 2012 is, a, is an amazing thing. You see, it took 50 years from the prediction of the Higgs to the actual laboratory discovery. Then uh, if you think gravitational waves is the most other amazing thing, you know, like oh, and so on. Now, now science seems to be very collaborative, very participative, international consortium. Now, there may be other discoveries. For instance, there are still many things which are still kind of hanging fire. Discovery of monopoles has not yet happened, for instance. Or neutrino properties are not fully explored. We have much more information today than we did 20 years ago. We know that, for instance, for uh, the solar neutrino problem, we know that it has to be a large mixing angle with uh, MSW enhancement. We know that some outstanding issues that were there partially described by theory, had to wait for an experimental validation. So this neutrino sector with atmospheric and uh, solar neutrinos, I think, is a, is a very landmark thing where theory was ahead of experiment. Uh, and then, of course, experiment had to catch up. Where would the next uh, uh, big thing come from? It's very hard to say. It's almost impossible. Supposing there's a supernova which goes off in the Milky Way close to us, that could be a game changer, right? For instance, 1987A, the supernova was in one of the Magellanic clouds. And uh, all these black hole mergers that we have seen uh, in LIGO have taken place in very far away places. Supposing there's a black hole merger right here in the Milky Way or in you know, some nearby same Magellanic clouds, they would be much closer. And then you would have a very precise signal of what black hole mergers actually do, for instance. Um, some of my own work recently has been in exploration of uh, mathematical properties of Feynman integrals, of which Kumar is a great expert, many others. We don't know, maybe Feynman integrals will influence mathematics or mathematics may influence. <clears throat> there is also, of course, uh, high TC superconductivity is not to really be settled. There are uh, condensed matter systems where many puzzles are there. It could be plasma physics, where you may want to have more energy production and have a lot of control on, you know, on confinement of plasma and energy production. A lot of such things are there, which have kind of fallen back because of technical bottlenecks. So if there is some advance in technology, maybe we will see some results. I, these are all my own, my own views. They have no other validity. It's an opinion just like anybody else's opinion. And even young people, including the student who asked me this question, he or she should have their own opinions, okay? Based on, of course, rational stuff, not just on, and reading and uh, deep research on these issues. Have I answered the question? 
Yeah, ho- hopefully, possibly. Uh, Jyotirmai, I hope you are satisfied with the answer. So a- any other questions from the students uh, or from the other faculty members, postdocs, anyone? He says yes, he yes. is happy. Okay. Oh, he's happy, satisfied, good. So if if not, uh, Prasanth, can I ask a very general yeah, question? Yeah. So this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, did uh, Stephen Weinberg suffer in one way or the other? He got affected by the Second World War because he must be very at a early stage. Of it doesn't. He was born. So. It doesn't seem to be so because uh, when it came to Murray Gelman, I if you I don't know if you were at my talk at your place. There's very much uh, evidence that uh, because Maria's father uh, had suffered during the Great Depression, not so much because of the war, but because of the Depression, 1929, which was the year of the birth of Maria Gelman, his business collapsed and then they had to move essentially into some kind of community housing. So Maria's early years seem to have been really scarred by poverty. Uh, as far as Weinberg is concerned, I don't think he talks about any of these things. Uh, let's see, 1933, so he was 12 or even 11 by the time uh, the European theater war had finished. Of course, Japan was, uh, and Weinberg was 12 years old. Doesn't seem, he has not talked about it. One thing he does say is uh, his interest in science was uh, kindled by a cousin who gave him a chemistry set when he was in school. So it's also interesting because it says that they had fairly close family ties with extended family. Something in India we are used to, but generally in Western societies, one doesn't care much about cousins and so on. Right? So that's the one piece of evidence. The other thing is that he got married very early. He was, uh, they were barely 21, 22 by the time they were married. So he just settled down to a very stable domestic situation and concentrated on his work. Everybody who knows Weinberg makes the comment that he was incredibly hardworking. So this is an amazing feature. The other thing, if you uh, would like to keep in mind, is he his Nobel Prize was 42 years ago. He was 88 when he passed away, which means that the Nobel Prize was just some it was just an event. It had some importance. He was back to work after that. You see, so you see where his commitment is. His commitment was to physics and to particle physics, and he worked. And he was writing these books till, I mean, till a year or two ago, he was still writing these books. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions or comments from the younger audience? Okay, I should promise uh, the Devashish that this is yeah. the last time I'm going to give this Weinberg talk. So this is it, no more. So. Oh, okay, <laughs> I think he just left the meeting for another one. Okay. I will All right. to him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if there are no further questions or comments, maybe let us thank Professor Anand for such thank a nice talk and for his me. time as well. Uh, so you. we hope to see you sometime once the pandemic subsides physically in our campus and thank you very much thank you. bye 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 so we can close the meeting now